totally made up. Pure fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made-up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. It never happened. This one was invented. It never happened. It's false. It never happened. It's a fake. Okay. Positive mutations that we've observed. In the lab, Pseudonomus aeruginosa bacteria evolved the necessary enzymes to eat previously unusable synthetic nylon. A mutation that makes a bear's fur white is very helpful in the Arctic and very detrimental in the forest. Okay, so, yeah, obviously we agree that they're environmentally de dependent, but it comes down to, once again, net loss versus net gain, okay? If you're going up a, a, you know, a mountain and, and you're taking one step up and 10 steps backward, it's not, it's not going to help you. And the majority proves the rule. And he used the, um, well, we know nylon digestion is, is a loss of specificity, but in regards to the Milano protein, and I'll let you kind of go into this, but I know for a fact that in gaining, you know, this antioxidant activity, the protein involved in this, it lost a lot of activity for making HDLs. So the mutant protein is actually, uh, just like the nylon digestion, sacrifice specificity. So once again, net loss versus net gain is not looking too well for evolution, right, Matt? Absolutely. For, for the first thing, that bacteria that he's talking about, that doesn't exactly digest nylon. It digests broken down bits of the nylon molecule. It's just sloppy scholarship that they wanted to sell, so they, they advertised it differently. They've also found that there's over 355 different bacterial species that have the exact same genes. Some of them even live in the anorex soils, far removed from humanity where there's no nylon existing. So they can turn those genes on when they need them. So if that was true, then you're telling me that a gene formed for uh, that bacteria never came into contact with so, uh, over the last, what, 70 or 40 years has this uh, uh, nylon even existed? So in the last 40 years, uh, Arctic bacteria needed to evolve this thing that it's never encountered before? It doesn't even make any sense. You know, I, I, and I don't like to straw man the evolutionists. Like, for example, there are so population geneticists do admit that man is degenerating, and, and they've come up with rescue devices, of course, such as mutation count mechanisms, synergistic epistasis. I'm going to provide papers that show that um, these are not biologically real, and, and they've also been falsified because these low impact deleterious mutations they are uh, they are accumulating in the genome, and a lot of your um, better proponents of evolution, you know, say Jackson, Weed, R, and Ron, you know, they talk a lot about a, a trade-off, okay, in regards to beneficial mutations, but I'd like to see what your answer is to this, because, uh, Joseph, while the whole genome is degenerating, and say, while a few nucleotide sites may be improving, huge numbers, it's a fact, they're being degraded, and this type of trade-off that a lot of these um, stronger proponents of evolution, you know, talk about it's obviously not sustainable and what it does is it results in a shrinking functional genome size um, so if you're throwing out all this information there uh, Joseph from lots of nucleotide sites based on all these mutations even duplications are largely deleterious because genes are inherited from two parents the textbook copier should have two originals in front of them as they do the work thereby increasing the chances that an unaltered version would carry forward it would also need the concept of beneficial mutations where these books might also be improved by the students copying them. These improved copies would be even more favored to hand over to the new students than the originals. Yeah, I would say natural selection is just a fancy way of saying, you know, differential reproduction, you know, who's reproducing the most. But I wrote a few a few things down on, on what you said here. So, uh, for example, uh, you said beneficial mutations are rare and the genome is constantly uh, degrading. And, and we see entropic degeneration on, on a genomic level. So I, I agree with that. Uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that due to the rarity of, of, of say beneficial mutations that are actually not deleterious to some extent, those beneficial mutations are not gonna compensate for, um, as I said, I, I think it comes down to a net loss versus a net gain of information. Those beneficial mutations are not gonna compensate for uh, the net loss of, of information. And, Natural selection, because because you talked about um, traits, you know, natural selection, it's it's a fine tuning mechanism. You know, it it keeps the the species as good as it can be. So I don't disagree with that. So we do agree on that. But it's severely right. constrained by you know what's called selection interference. And and just to go into that a little bit, you know, 
selecting for one trade, as you talked about, interferes with selecting for another trade. And when you have billions of traits, Taylor, you know, segregating in, in the population, then the selection process actually starts to work against itself. And what that means at the end of the day is that you end up uh, with being able to only select the best and worst mutations as, as I talked about earlier. So I think evolutionists, I think you're guilty of this right now, they assume based on universal common ancestry, right? It's gotta be true type thing. So they're assuming that these mutations, they're gonna have a net neutral effect, but we know that's wrong based on uh, this selection um, interference. And, and I think just to put it in a nutshell and on everything that you said there and I wrote down, the problem is that, you know, we know that beneficial mutations are very rare, which we agree on, so that's good. And non-neutral mutations are consistently deleterious as we should actually expect, um, you know, with typographical errors in a in attack. So I think increasing fitness is going to be very difficult uh, and, and very much problematic. And you talked about, you know, beneficial mutations, say in bacteria, uh, or just beneficial mutations in, in general. The problem that I have, though, Taylor, is that you know, the best beneficial mutations, they're mostly reductive. Let's, let's take sickle cell anemia, for example. It's got a significant impact. What it is, it's a broken gene, broken protein. And in the long run, it's, it's not really taking things forward and it's not really addressing the issue of neck broken pain. Is relative. Neck loss. It just doesn't work the way that you want it to maybe for uh, oxygenation, but it has other beneficial effects. So you're um, saying it's okay. So you're saying it's deleterious in one way, but it's beneficial in another. But I'm saying it comes down to a net loss versus a net gain. So how are you going to compensate for the information loss based on you know a couple rare beneficial mutations? Because if if you're throwing out a ton of information, you know, and and, and you're seeing erosion of um, information, erosion of of nucleotides. How are you going to compensate for the actual information loss? Because a couple of rare beneficials are not going to um, counterbalance the accumulating damage. So with me, under the assumption of death, decay, degeneration, that's consistent. But to take your fish to fishermen or your, or your bacteria to biologist and, and build a genome, I don't know how you're going to build a genome by um, degrading information. While it's true that mutations can sometimes create new traits, they generally only work to destroy existing traits and information. So when a new trait called sickle cell anemia arose in Africa, it allowed people to survive malarial infections. It was a new trait, but the hemoglobin gene was broken in the process. Likewise, many examples of antibiotic resistance of bacteria deal with broken genes for transporting things into the cell. The reason that the bacteria can live is because the transporter gene is broken, the poison can't get in. It's easier to break something then to create something new. Natural selection plus mutation actually works in the wrong direction for evolution. There's no such thing as an objectively good mutation or an objectively bad mutation. To even think that there are 96,000 deleterious mutations building up in the human genome every four years, which cause cancer and all types of health issues, is not objectively bad is insane. You can sequence the genomes, you can look at the various types of mutations, deletions, point mutations, inversion mutations, frame shift mutations, they're all reductive. You can sequence the genome, see what's being, um, obviously see what, what type of loss is uh, being observed there. You can look at variation within the genome, you could look at decreases of heterozygosity to homozygosity. There's lots of different ways to measure the information loss. You, you, everybody knows beneficial mutations are rare. Uh, you know, near neutral deleterious mutations are pouring in faster than they can be removed. You can calculate the fact that we, um, you know, that we inherit 100 new mutations per person per generation from our grandparents. I mean, there's a thousand different ways that you can um, measure the information loss. And, and the thing is, when something's broken, so for example, sickle, sickle cell anemia, you know, if it's due to a, a, a broken, you know, protein, broken cell, broken gene, I mean, broken indicates that it's it's a loss of, of some type. I mean, are you disagreeing with the fact that a lot of these adaptive degenerative mutations are a loss of information? Is this just an evolutionary tactic to avoid the, the obvious data? I have no idea to be honest, but I would also like you, since you're making the claim that they're rare, but how, 
how rare versus rare when it comes to beneficial mutations? Well, the thing is, you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to compensate for the relentless influx of deleterious mutations. So, can you give me one or two? Um, beneficial mutations that are not reductive, that are not, you know, due to a loss of information of any, any kind. Because I even know the big ones that I've, I've talked to, you know, people like Jackson Weed a bunch of times. They bring up things like melano mutation, examples of adaptive immunity, nylon digestion by bacteria. I mean, these are all based on a loss of, say, specificity, a loss of information. You can read this all in, in the mm-hmm. literature. Positive mutations that we've observed. If you prefer examples among humans... In a small community in Italy, a mutant version of the apolipoprotein A I proliferated that is more effective at removing cholesterol, giving carriers of the gene significantly lower risk for heart attack and stroke. This mutated protein is being researched as a possible future treatment. While mutations to lipoprotein receptor protein 5 can cause osteoporosis, one mutation can significantly amplify bone density and strength. The real-world carriers of this gene were the inspiration for the film Unbreakable. When you hear about people saying there's such thing as beneficial mutations and we need them and that's how we evolved and they bring up the lactose mutation and the increase in bone density and the HIV-1 immunity and then the L. Milano, these, these are all epigenetic regulations. These are not mutations. And so now that we've been unraveling the sequences of epigenetics for the last six years really, really well, they've actually completely eradicated the beneficial mutation theory. So basically what I want to do is get into the the problems that people are having um, with the concept. And that would be, I guess, kind of explaining epigenetics. So basically epigenetic inheritance is this uh, new unconventional way of looking at genetics. Up until now, a mutation was considered the only thing that could be either positive or negative in regards to fitness because without mutations, evolution can occur. So this is where epigenetic comes from, and it throws, it goes against basically the idea that uh, inheritance only happens through genetic mutations, or the DNA code passes on to the parent from offspring. This means that a parent's experiences in the form of epigenetic tags can be passed down to future generations. So circadian rhythm, diet, stress, environment, all of these switches, for example, like rats. Um, They took rats and they put them in an aquarium and they switched the lights on for three hours and off for three hours. And they kept doing this for years. And eventually those rats adapted to this light cycle. So when they had offspring, those children now would fall asleep every three hours and fall every three hours, just like the parents were doing, even if the lights were not being turned on or off for every three hours. Sometimes it was inherited, other times it was not. And then after a couple generations of lights being back to 24 hours, the rats just essentially gave up on that and they went back to being a 24 hour cycle. So it wasn't a permanent thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a mutation that caused this. So epigenetics is a study of where factors influence a gene and how and when the gene is expressed regarding like the Sherpas of the high altitude people of the Nepal. Uh, The mainstream thought is that a single one point mutation led to a better adaptation for the high altitudes of the Tibetan people. But modern science has revealed that the epigenetic mechanisms are also behind this adaptation. It's not a beneficial mutation. You can read a uh, peer-reviewed paper on this, um, on the epigenetic signatures of the high altitude adaptation of the Tibetan population. So basically, these epigenetic regulators affect how individuals develop. Uh, This is uh, pretty much which are causes of changes in the expression of the genes or action of a gene or any gene. Uh, We have longevity genes in us, for example. They're called the FOXO genes, and they're seven sirtuin genes, and these are mediated by epigenetics. They're not mutations. They're turned on and off. Like uh, for fasting, for example, uh, turns off an mTOR, and it activates these longevity genes. We want that to happen. And until we can go in and mutate these genes and constantly leave them on, we have to rely on epigenetics to do that. And we are in control of these genes by what we do. If you think about it like twins, uh, twins have identical DNA. And uh, think about it like one person turns 50 years old and so does the other one, right? But one will have cancer or heart disease, the other uh, might not. One will go bald or be bipolar or start to lose their eyesight where the other doesn't. This is because of epigenetics. It's not inherited genetic mutations like we're told. Uh, Take, for example, the uh, epigenome, which keeps a long life communication between environment and our genes that that turn on and off tumor suppressing proteins. This is a reason why one twin will get cancer and the other will not, because epigenetic changes via the individual uh, diet or environment will 
it'll cause this. So when you hear about beneficial genetic mutations, you are actually hearing about epigenetic regulation, not beneficial mutations. This is why the Sherpa people who have, uh, you know, been called beneficial muta mutations that allow them to thrive at this high altitude. Yet when they relocate and have children, they pass on none of these beneficial mutations, so-called, for these high altitudes because they have no genetic requirement for living at such altitudes. So again, it was never a beneficial mutation. It was uh, already present in the gene that got switched on. Evidence is, uh, is now shown in that it's nurture over nature. So to make matters worse for evolutionary theory, epigenetic modifications themselves are actually often resulted in DNA errors. And this leads to gradual but inevitable DNA degradation as well. So epigenetic adaptation will never result in any kind of evolution because epigenetic mechanisms only regulate pre-existing biological information. Since epigenetics is not mutation-based and there is no actual proof for beneficial mutations anymore of all these things that we're talking about, like the, like the lactose mutation, they claim that it was a single SNP, a single point mutation resulting in the lactose uh, persistence, but that's wrong. It's epigenetics like all the rest. Um, they, it's actually a methylation level, uh, MCM6 and LCT genes. So as far as the more they look into the epigenetics, the more that they find that it's that relation and it's not a mutation at all. The idea of forward or backward implies that evolution has some kind of directionality for it. It does not. Evolution is not random, and it directly states that it is in a linear progression into all life that we observe today from a single cell, bacteria like species. Mm -hmm.